I've got my chat. I've got my chat window open, so uh, you can ask questions or not ask questions to your delight. And um, the reason I'm doing it this way is that because of some weird oddity involving my screen that I actually have in a monitor, uh, the actual presentation appears bigger when I give it in this format as opposed to me giving it in the actual PowerPoint presentation format. That is a factor to deal with the monitor I'm working with, and I'm so sorry. It also happens in my classes. And so this is, believe it or not, the most visible way I can show it to you. But uh, um, I encourage you, if you have any questions about not reading something, slowing down, going over points in more detail, I'm happy to address them. And so let's talk about this. So first of all, this is this is our last of our three sessions. I see some common names in there and some common in, in some in some faces I've seen before. Um, I'm so grateful you've been able to make it. If you hit one of these sessions, two of these sessions, three of, three of these sessions, I'm so grateful that you are here. Um, as part of the initiatives on, on NMNU, one of the things that we brainstormed was uh, for many people approaching retirement, it's not going to be uh, a finality. It's not going to be the last career they might ever have. And I know a lot of people may be working or they may not be working and they might have careers working uh, uh, for firms and uh, they might be looking and saying, what else can I do? And one of the things we're going to talk about, one of the things we're going to talk about today is the process in setting up a business. And I want you to think about this as not an intimidating factor for you to worry about uh, or feel like you are inherently disadvantaged at. And, and this is very, very important. Um, if you haven't, and, and I know that some of you in the audience have started businesses before, and I'm gonna add content to you to add to these things to think about, and we'll go over some other issues about how to grow and expand your business. But if you haven't started a business before, or it's been a couple of decades, or it's been a little while, and you're concerned about this, how does this even start? How do I do this? Why would I do this? Uh, these are the questions that I'm happy to answer with uh, answer uh, for you today in this presentation and in the chat window. And uh, in my own experience, the first thing, so I've had uh, the joy of starting a couple of, of, of small businesses as well as serving in the last five years on three different um, governing boards or executive boards for, for different institutions, uh, both nonprofit and for profit. Um, you get a sense about uh, when I, when I had my, when my first years ago, <laughs> too long ago, when I graduated uh, uh, my undergraduate college, my first job was actually in, uh, in a bank uh, uh, as an analyst uh, uh, for a large bank. And, and one of our roles was to evaluate companies. We had to evaluate whether companies were worthy of funding, were worthy of these things. And, and, and that ties into a lot of legal questions. It ties into a lot of uh, uh, business ownership questions. It ties into a lot of collateral questions. But uh, I, again, I don't want you to be intimidated. The whole purpose of this presentation is to give you the confidence that you need to have the conversations to get going on what your dreams are. And I'm so excited to talk about this. So this is really great. So here's our plan for today. And uh, first thing I'm going to go over are a couple of quick resources that I want you to consider. I thought about including this at the end, but I thought, oh my goodness, if they can look them up sooner rather than later, that's even better. Um, and the second question we're going to address is what kind of business should I create? Many of you are already aware, and I know you might be acutely aware of the differences between partnerships and LLCs and sole proprietorships. I'm going to underline a few big issues on this because there are some things I want you to know, uh, and especially if it's been a couple of years since you've started a business, uh, raising money. Let's talk about that section. Maybe you have a business already and you're looking to expand it and you're looking for potential partners. What do you look for in these partners? How do you evaluate them? Where do you go? How do you, uh, 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 how can you engage someone in a way with something that you built and trusted a huge part of your life to, and then give them things like partial ownership in. And then we'll go over Q&A and other things as well. And uh, those of you on board who, who saw it or, or are, might be entrepreneurs in their own right already, uh, either through uh, New Mexico Angels or one of the organizations, John Mertz, or all of these, these other supporters that we've had for this program who might have seen this on LinkedIn, uh, I'm so grateful to have you here as well. And again, uh, regardless of the level of which you are coming in, I want you to feel comfortable about asking questions. 
So first of all, resources. So the first thing is, so, and I mean, this is geared a little bit towards small business administrations. Many of you might be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies already. I'm not quite certain, but let's say, let's say, I'm gonna take the benefit of the doubt and say that most of your businesses are what we would call small businesses. And how is that defined under something like the Small Business Administration? Well, you'll find this very amusing. Do you have fewer than 500 employees? And if you have fewer than 500 employees, you are technically speaking a small business. And indeed, uh, uh, in New Mexico, we have about 157,000 small businesses. Now we have a population of just under 2.1 million. And that includes everybody, men, women, children, uh, 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 and retirees. Uh, uh, and if you, if you do the math on that, you're saying, how can that possibly be, Riley? We have a workforce of 900,000 of that 2.1 million and 156,000 are small businesses. Most businesses in New Mexico, as with the rest of the country, are structured as sole proprietorships. And we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and uh, collectively, small businesses in New Mexico employ nearly uh, or approximately half of the total workforce uh, in New Mexico. Uh, it is big, it is important, and it is important to know these things. In New Mexico, uh, uh, um, uh, I want you to it, I want you to always do a few elements of homework before you get your business. And my caveats to this as well is if you have questions, never hesitate to consult professionals. The Small Business Administration has this great little link here, which actually links you to some of the topics we talk about today about choosing the business structure that's right for you. Uh, the SBA usually partners, for instance, of this, the US Small Business Administration. They partner with uh, your local banks, your local credit unions to provide you financing uh, on, a many, on many individual loans. So for instance, um, uh, when I was working in the bank, uh, I worked with the SBA group and what they did was they helped uh, uh, identify financing opportunities that you might worry you don't qualify for. But I want you to pay attention to a few things. You might have a woman-owned business. You might have a minority-owned business. You might have something that affords you a lot of grants and opportunities uh, out there right now. And I want you to follow them and be linked to these resources. And the SBA is a great launching point to pursue those things. Now, the second thing is taxes, taxes, taxes. If somebody, <laughs> the last thing you wanna do, and this is the last thing you wanna do is ignore paying taxes. And when we deal with these questions, we see it on the news, so-and-so failed to pay 6 million in taxes, failed to pay 800,000 in taxes. How could this happen? It is usually through, in many cases, uh, the businesses that they've owned and operated themselves uh, because, and we'll go over a little bit on that as well, but I always want you to clear off, look at IRS right here. The IRS is less intuitively designed than the SBA. I think they need a user experience researcher on the IRS to get them a little bit up and, uh, up and running on those things, uh, but it is loaded with useful information, facts, in data, and particularly for me, who might be quantitatively minded, as many of you, the IRS is a fantastic source. And then thirdly on this list, we have New Mexico Angels. Now, New Mexico Angels, of course, they've been very courteous. They help publicize this particular event, but they're actually our only New Mexico-based group of what we call accredited investors. So one of the ways that we look for a lot of startup companies out there, and I want to encourage you to be ambitious about the plans that you have for your company, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is identifying financing opportunities. And we'll get over the difference between debt financing and equity financing and what these all means. But New Mexico Angels have sponsored through their membership many different projects around New Mexico. And their website kind of details a little bit about them. Angel investors are, are to be accredited investors. You are often usually self-made entrepreneur millionaires. And what you do is you look for other opportunities to, to, to go and find investments that make sense to you. And uh, often they're a source of great resources. They're always good at engagement. And even if you have a chance to propose in front of the Mexico Angels and uh, they decide that they don't have the bandwidth or it's not a, a good fit for their investment opportunities, you'll have a learning experience associated with it. That is, that's phenomenal. So I want you to think about these things, think about our partners locally and think about, always, always, always think about talking to other people about all the ideas that you have, 
running it by them to make sure that they can get on board as well. So let's go over a few things. So first of all, now that that's out of the way, let's think about what business might be right for you. And this is really, really tricky. And, and, and I'll provide some anecdotes, examples, et cetera, et cetera. So the ownership structure of your business becomes really, really important. One of the first questions you have to ask yourself is how many people are going to be part of this business with you? Are you doing this as an individual? Are you sharing this with a significant other? Are you sharing this with friends, colleagues, or business partners? And then I could give you all of this wisdom about why, why getting into business with people that you're friends with can be a really bad idea sometimes. But uh, uh, you can look at all of these. That was the first business I actually had. We did a brewery, and that was, that was very fun. Uh, uh, and that was hard because I didn't grow up with any money, and I was always, I'm very risk averse by nature. So uh, uh, when you put money forth and run a business, you want to do it very carefully and make sure that you have all the building blocks in place. And the second question is, is how will you run the business? And this becomes very interesting. Do you see yourself primarily as an investor or do you see yourself as the person who is making the financial decisions? Think about your role in that business. Are you making, are you a decision maker or are you not a decision maker? You're an investor. Think about what that means. Now, what services are you going to provide? Related to that question, what can you do to bring to the table? If you're joining this with this clear with, with other partners, what are, what are your roles and responsibilities? Uh, 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 and how can you make that, or how can you translate that into building value for the business itself? And the other thing is tax issues. And as you know, the simplest designation between these two things is whether you want to have pass-through taxes. So for instance, uh, uh, if you have a sole proprietorship or an LLC, that means that the money you make flows through and that re gets reported as income uh, on your um, on your annual tax return. Uh, likewise, you might decide to elect to have a corporation or a C corporation or something like that, which, is, which exposes you to double taxes, but has its own series of benefits. Double taxation is when they both tax you on the salary that you might earn, as well as taxing you on things like dividends you get from the company, other things as well. And so it depends if you view it as a separate entity or something that flows through on your own income statement. Other important things to consider, okay. Filing fees and cost of incorporation. The good news is these numbers have come down a lot in the last couple of decades because there's a lot of competition in the space. The bad news is if you simply run a Google search on start company, you'll get a whole bunch of websites, all of which look equally convincing. Uh, with regards to whether or not they can provide you information or not. If you remember my, if you were happened to be at my first session, I gave a section about financial fraud and how seniors in particular are good targets for people to exhibit financial fraud. Do not give personal information to non-accredited services. I have two services listed here that I'm only, that I'm not necessarily recommending, but I have used them in the past and I can vouch for them as being credible. And that's inkfile.com and legalzoom.com. Now, uh, uh, you can also go to a lawyer yourself that, that deals in business operations. They will help you get through this. So what happens is when you set up an entity, you have to think about, uh, you might have to think about articles of incorporation. There's a lot of other issues. And the more larger the entity or, 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 or say, hmm, uh, uh, the more careful you have to be around certain issues. And I would always advise you speaking to a business professional, uh, especially in, in, in the legal sphere, because as we're going to find out when we talk about some of this, uh, uh, we're going to engage, oops, sorry about this, I have a couple of Yep, sorry, had a little bit of a, of a, of a computer snafu. Um, as, you get, as you get beyond this session, the legal side of this becomes really, really important. So in addition, this is uh, something less that your financial manager can handle, but also your legal manager uh, or your lawyer, uh, whoever you feel comfortable with. If you have simple businesses, they do lend themselves favorably to these online services. I will note a couple things about that. The advertised price is often lower than what you'll actually pay. And so 
for instance, for things like Inkfile and Legal Zoom, they'll charge you one thing for helping you incorporate and another thing to be something called a registered agent, which we're going to get into, which is a way to say, listen, uh, uh, we'll be a registered agent uh, domiciled in the state of your residence and we'll help represent your company. Basically, it's who gets served in the events of legal documents and other things happening. And it is a requirement in incorporation in many places. So how much is this going to cost me, you're asking these things? And so one thing is, is the benefit is in New Mexico, we have one of the lowest LLC filing costs of any state, and it's only $50. But when you add in additional costs, or especially these services, um, expect it to range from $200 to $1,000 for a small business. And it goes up very, much higher than that, particularly if you have to address a number of concerns. Uh, if you have a number of, if you're, if you're, for instance, starting a business with employees already, those numbers go up significantly. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And the other thing is personal liability concerns. Nobody wants to get sued. No one ever wants, no one wakes up in the morning and says, what a great day to get sued. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we live in a society where uh, uh, you can be sued. We can be sued any day for anything, regardless necessarily uh, for good reasons or for bad reasons. And that's why liability concerns come to the forefront. And I want you to be aware of them and take this into consideration because it's really, really important. Even if you're looking at a, starting a new business as something like, I just want to consult. I've worked for 20 or 30 years in an industry, and I just want to do some consulting work. Starting a business that affords you some liability protection is a great way to avoid it. And think of it this way. Let's say you ran the calculations. They dispute a number on these things. If you are protected from liability concerns, uh, uh, often you're only liable up to the amount of your actual investment in that company. And you don't want to be personally liable. You don't want to have creditors coming after your cars or houses or other things. And this is a very small likelihood, but it's something that I want you to be aware of and be cognizant of these things. And uh, that ties into one of our stories uh, uh, in how LLCs came to be in the first place. And then, of course, there's the question of pass-through taxation. Do you want an easy to complete tax return or a harder one? And that's going to depend on whether your taxes get passed through directly to you or not. All right. And so when we think about these things, and I have to always, if you've seen my presentations before, there's at least one apocalyptic slide that deals with what happens with bankruptcy, what happens with fraud. This one asks, why do businesses fail? And failure is okay. Most businesses fail. Indeed, even really successful companies, the average tenure of one of the, if we look at the 500 largest companies that are on the S&P 500, uh, the average tenure of a publicly traded company, that's that level of success is only about two to three decades, 20 or 30 years. Eventually you might be bought out. Eventually you might go bankrupt. There isn't, it is a, uh, a uh, reasonable uh, factor in the evolution of corporations to expect this. So don't worry about this. Don't beat yourself up on this. And uh, just know that failure is okay if it's done well. So why do they fail though? First of all, uh, businesses often lack a clear direction or a clearly defined business purpose. It is very tempting to start diversifying your business, especially if you're doing it and you might have a hobby or something else, you're putting in time and somebody asks you to do something else and they say, can you do this as well? Or can you also do this? And it might be slightly out of your uh, uh, expertise, but you think, well, wait a second, uh, this is a client, they're important to me. I think I can meet those expectations. I think I can achieve that. And unfortunately, then you get off track. You wanna keep the track going, you wanna keep your expertise going and only work in areas where you feel comfortable with clear direction and purpose. Do not be sidetracked by other ideas. Second, who are your clients and customers going to be? Who are you marketing to? So it might be something, let's say you could be, uh, for instance, doing consulting, you could be making, let's say we have a, uh, one of the people uh, uh, um, I, I know that I've talked to recently has been, they were a small, um, very customized manufacturer of, of very personalized artistic items. Uh, and they used websites like Etsy and other things to get that, get that dispersed. 
and, uh, and, and, but they knew particularly what their design was about and who their client was. And if you know who your client or customers are, you know who's going to buy your product and who you will market to specifically. And my guess is if you happen to see the advertisement uh, uh, from New Mexico New on your webpage, it was probably if you were surfing Facebook or something else and saw, wait a second, NM New with as a lecture on this, it was probably because NM New has a clearly defined uh, target audience of individuals. Poor management is a very interesting question. So poor management comes in many different flavors. And, and I want to give you an example of this. And, and this is, we always suffer from the question of, uh, we might have an expertise in one area, and that may fail to translate into an expertise in another area. And, and we see this a lot. And I know my dear colleagues and friends at, at, at Sandia Labs understand this well, and as well as Los Alamos, you'll start a technical business. You have immense technical knowledge. Can you sell the product that you make? And sometimes we try to do both things. Sometimes you try to be a salesperson for a product that, uh, 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 that you know in and out, the technical specifications, you know how it's built, and you know exactly what you bring to the table in terms of design and the history of that evolution. And now you're confronted by a completely different set of problems that unprepares you. And it's no test like you've ever felt like. You have to walk into a room of people with little scientific knowledge and convince them that this product makes sense. That is such a different skill. Could you hire somebody for that? Could you develop that skill within yourself? Acknowledge what you do well and acknowledge what you do not do well. And I have a list this long of the stuff that, gosh, I do not do well. <laughs> it's good. And I'm proud of that list. And I'm working on them every day. And the other one, not enough capital. This is a really interesting, this is a double-edged sword, right? You don't need to start with tons of money necessarily, but it depends on your business. Your business might require a lot of money. There might be no way for you to build a prototype, no way to buy a store or an outlet to sell the goods or services that you wish to produce without some form of capital outlay. And, and, and this is tricky. And think of it this way. Imagine you have a choice of, and we'll think of it simply using an example of retail stores. You have a retail store that has the time to create a, and the money to create this immense customer experience. They know exactly who their customer is. You walk into that store, you feel immediately comfortable. The design of the store and, uh, welcomes you. And the other person focuses merely on something. They look at the design as a very secondary or tertiary thing. I have products or services. And they don't spend time on marketing, they don't spend time on advertising, they don't spend time on building out what their facility looks like. A picture of a business is a full, um, it's, a, it's, it's a full entity. And, uh, and, and, and I would be careful, make sure you have reasonable expectations, know what capital requirements are and how you can get them. Now, growing too fast or too slow, it seems, uh, uh, it seems a little bit uh, uh, paradoxical that a company growing too quickly would go out of business. And, and we see this very often. And, and the thing is with this is you see, suddenly you have a huge increase in demand for your product or service, and you have to meet that increased demand. What do you spend money on? How do you generate money? First of all, can you get money to meet the expansion? If you get money to meet the expansion, can you invest it in the right ways? Is it facilities, products, plants, equipment? Is it people? And then what happens when you scale those processes up? You'll find that this is not, it's not always you go from this small business to economies of scale in a short amount of time where suddenly you have a giant factory producing widgets. That intermediary process is really, really, really hard to manage. And so many businesses fail because they can't do it. They expand too quickly, right? And so for instance, an observation that I made back when one of the places we used to lend to were restaurants. Restaurants do really well when they first open. Restaurants do really well when they first open or back did during the before, before the uh, pre-COVID times in the, in, the, in the before times, let's call it. Uh, uh, when you opened a restaurant, you'd get a lot of business. If it was marketed well and the business was good, people would arrive at the business because it was a novelty. It's not always this case, but if you did the business well, you looked at the location and said, this is great. You have a lot of people who are searching for novelty. That customer base trails off two months, three months, four months down the line. 
You could hit records with financing in the first month. Decide that you want to build a second business and a third restaurant. You want to build two or three restaurants very quickly in a short amount of time. You have the will and the capital, but then find that the novelty item wears off and suddenly you have three businesses now that might be underwater as opposed to merely just one. And I have so many examples of those. Financial management, on the other hand, this is very important. One week, and an old adage from a dear friend uh, is, that the, is that they saw businesses fail in response to failure in working capital. Working capital, if you look at, if you think about these things in its simplest form is current assets minus current liabilities. It's the amount of stuff you have on hand that's liquid, like cash, for instance. And it's the amount of stuff you have to pay in a short amount of time. Bills you have to pay with short deadlines. They're, uh, 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 um, your current portion of something like a, a business loan or a mortgage, uh, current liabilities. If current liabilities grow faster than current assets, it can put you in a really tough situation because you might find yourself out of cash, unable to pay for employees and do these other things as well. And I will say this as well, and this is coming from a finance professor, don't just look at finance. <laughs> just come. I have dedicated my life into finance. You can create a hypothetically wonderful company and it will fail if you just focus on the finance itself. Never, never underestimate those soft factors, those marketing factors, just the human factors that make your businesses work. Um, and so let's go through a couple of these business types. I know you're aware of some of these right now, and I never want you to hesitate to reach out and ask questions as we go through these. So the first one, the most common business in New Mexico and the United States as a whole, indeed about 73% of all businesses are what we call sole proprietorships. This means the owner in the business is the same person. So any money you make in the business flows through your, incomes, in, your income taxes. This is super easy to maintain and build. I have a business, so uh, I mean, I, I'm not me person. I have an LLC, but I'll explain why. Uh, so proprietorships uh, uh, allow you, it's, it's the confidence of you owning a business and allowing that to flow through on your income statement. What can possibly go wrong? It has little or often no additional registration needed to create this. It is simple and cheap. It is one of the cheapest forms of new businesses that you can establish because you don't need anything special. You don't have employees. You can use your own social security number. You don't have to apply for an EIN, an employer identification number. It is an easy way to do these things. Now, cons, and I highlighted this con because it is important, liability risk. I know nobody intends to do something. Nobody intends, even if you're selling something at a farmer's market and somebody's, uh, uh, and you have whatever goods on some glass plate and the strangest thing happens, lightning strikes from the sky, it hits your table, the glass shatters, and then somebody gets a paper cut on their finger 40 feet away and they decide they happen to be a very litigious person. And then they come after you and they try to sue you. What can they get if you're a sole proprietorship? The short answer is a lot of things. They can go after you for your personal assets, which include your things like your house, uh, uh, your valuables, your car, things that you might own. Creditors and lawsuits can go after these things and they can be brutal. And likewise, think about the ways we finance these businesses. The limiting factor for sole proprietorships is it's difficult, if not utterly impossible, to get external financing for that. In a bank, we, we would never look at, uh, 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 we never looked at uh, sole proprietorships as individual businesses, unless we had some form of protection. Sometimes you can make a case if, there, if there's good collateral or other things as well, but it's very trickier and it's absolutely impossible. It's hard on debt, impossible for equity uh, for reasons that we'll get into next to finance it. So it is good for those small businesses, but I do want you to take a word of caution on this liability risk. I know the odds are low. The odds are low, right? And, and it depends on whether or not these things happen. And it, it's, it's completely separate from your question of your intentions as an individual. Nobody, uh, I, I know the distinguished NM new crowd, none of you are going to go out and try to intentionally defraud anyone. 
but it's those accidents, those things that are out of your control, those things um, that you need to consider about. And the related thing to this, if you do approach sole proprietorships this way, make sure, uh, take a look into, and this goes for any organization as well, liability insurance, uh, liability insurance across the board for uh, different factors involving your business and entities. This might be expensive and it might not be sensible to uh, make sense for your business individually, but it is worth exploring at all times. Now, this is interesting. So people knew this back in uh, sole proprietorships. We've known this. This has been historically how people have had firms. And then in, in the 1970s, in 1977, the state of Wyoming came up with something completely interesting. And it's called, it was called a limited liability company. And this is true. Wyoming was the first state to allow this. This is part of, this is part of trivia night at the next time you wish to, you know, stand, you have relatives over, you have your friends over. Did you know that LLC started in 1977 with Wyoming? Uh, uh, limited liability companies allow you to either be just yourself or include, a, include one or more members. Um, Taxes for limited liability companies, and this is the cool part about them, are passed through, meaning that they'll flow through to your income statement. It has a little bit more, but not significantly more requirements to fill out your tax return every year, which makes it really nice for small businesses. It's cheap and simple on the diagram at the right. Uh, this is from true, uh, uh, how do, this is from the, the uh, true IC uh, uh, graphic here. Uh, Liability, a uh, cost to make an LLC. New Mexico is among the cheapest states to actually get one of these incorporated at $50 as a fee. Um, bizarrely, uh, Tennessee, uh, Texas, and Massachusetts are really expensive. Massachusetts, it costs $500 uh, to have one. Um, any person or entity can become an LLC member. And the big pro is that liability is usually limited to owner's investment. Now, there is some liability risk, which might not factor into a few of these things. Um, there's a big overlap here, and, and I got, uh, uh, I conversed with one of my um, colleagues in the legal realm, and they brought up some examples of liability risk in LLCs, particularly with things like securities violations or fraud or other things like this. Uh, uh, that does complicate and muddy the LLC picture. But assuming, generally speaking, you have a fairly ethical mindset with regards to LLCs, it should be straightforward to start. Now, external financing is still really hard with LLCs. If you're just operating an LLC and you're looking for a large injection of funding, it's hard to do this. You can still get it, but what happens is you're often reincorporated as something else. Uh, maybe a C corp or an S corp where the other people maintain a portion of that, of, of that revenue. Now setting up an LLC, I wanted to go through this a little bit and kind of break it down into the simplest possible number of steps. So newcomers to businesses as a whole, please, and this is one of my encouragement, use an accredited third party online service like the ones we mentioned or a lawyer who specializes into this. This makes things easier and it ensures you comply with state and federal laws when you start a business. Now the world of business ownership, I try to, I got, I tried to get down as simple as possible, five steps. First thing's the easiest one, name your LLC. And you can actually search online uh, through our uh, portal with our secretary of state in New Mexico, whether it exists or not. So the first thing when you start an LLC, make sure if it's fun and you start with fun LLC, and like, oh, somebody else has it. As long as it's different from something else in your state, you can have multiple LLCs with the same name in different states. These are state registered. Um, uh, and, and then what happens is the online service that you contract with or a lawyer or, or, uh, or often a lawyer, you appoint a registered agent. In its simplest form, it's someone who agrees to accept the papers if you're sued. And this person has to have an address in New Mexico. And you're probably asking yourself, how do these third party online places get an address in New Mexico? They rent PO boxes, uh, post office boxes. And so a company like Inkfile or, uh, or LegalZoom will go out and they'll say, oh, we'll just, our location is in uh, Farmington at this particular uh, post office box. And that's where <laughs> That's where they receive their mail and somebody picks it up for them. Now you file your New Mexico articles of organization with the secretary of state and pay the $50 fee. 
Articles of organization, that's an intimidating thing, but they're often very standardized for very particular types of businesses. Again, it depends on the type of business, but they're, they're, they're pretty straightforward. And you can set up an account here, and this is the link to the portal on the Secretary of State to get that done. You may need an operating agreement, uh, if especially, and this is basically setting out the rights and standards of each person in the LLC, the rights and sort of the responsibilities there, as well as ownership. Uh, uh, and this is needed if you have more than one member. So if you have three people and you're all starting a business, figure out the percentage of each business the person is responsible for and their individual responsibilities. You may elect to apply for an, something called an employer identification number on the IRS website. Now, this is always required, especially if you have things like employees and things like that. But if you remain small, you can permit to keep your social security number in most places. But the EIN uh, is a really cool thing. It's just a separate number, separate from your social security number. Um, it's very easy to apply for and very easy to get. And it also means that when you transact with your customers and clients, you're not giving out your social security number every time that you use it. And, and ultimately, if we think about the other part of our lecture on our first session about financial fraud, we know that if you can avoid giving out your social security number, please do so. So the EIN often replaces this uh, in official correspondence with, with individuals. Now, general partnership. All right. Oh, one more thing about LLCs, by the way. So it's interesting story. So Wyoming was the first state to start it in 1977. And there's actually a fun, a couple of uh, dodges about this. But then almost no other state started it for years. And the reason was, is why Wyoming, uh, most states were uncertain how the IRS would view the limited liability company with regards to how it would be taxed. Is it legal was the question for about 11 years until 1988, when the IRS came out with a rule called IRS 8876, if you want to be specific, uh, that came out and basically said, yes, we're going to tax these like partnerships. And, uh, then, and then between 1988 and 1996, all 50 states allowed for the creation of LLC. So they were waiting for the IRS to rule on it. And then everybody allowed it to happen in the 80s. And there's also other evidence to this as well uh, in respect to this. And I want to, and, and, and this goes back to uh, the, uh, an oil boom that happened in West Texas. And a good reason uh, brought about for why a lot of legislatures and people were interested in starting and forming an LLC or allowing uh, uh, their citizens to form LLCs uh, was back in this oil boom. Uh, there was you know, a lot of what we would call wildcatters, people who were speculating on where oil was and where it would be. And, uh, um, and they were able to convince many private individuals, many retirees who often had little experience in these things to be investors in partnerships for some of these very speculative investments. And what happened was, is when the boom turned into a bust, uh, these individuals found themselves on the hook, not only for the expenses incurred by the business, but they're being chased after from creditors uh, uh, for their house, for their car, for their belongings. And that is a devastating thing. So if you can uh, uh, keep yourself away from, uh, uh, from liability risk, uh, think about LLCs, think about how they work and think about how, um, uh, 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 how you can limit your liability. Now, general partnerships are also pretty common. Uh, uh, this is when you have two or more owners who manage the business and based on the percentage of ownership, taxes get passed through from the company. They're super cheap and super easy to set up. Uh, and uh, the losses, what's interesting about general partnerships, if you're particularly focused on a very specific type of business, and I would always double check whether or not something is tax deductible or not, uh, losses and business expenses often qualify really easily as personal tax deductions. And uh, that's one benefit here. But with a general partnership, and this is not a limited liability partnership, you share the same liability risk as a sole proprietorship. So this is a sole proprietorship with more than one person. And it's easy to understand and easy to work with, but uh, again, you still have that same liability risk. And uh, and I guess on the other side of it, that if you do spend a lot on your business, you have it's equipment standard. You might be, I don't know, I don't know, I wouldn't I wouldn't set up this if I was a physician or anything, but or a lawyer or something else like this. Uh, you can act, you have you can have a lot of personal tax deductions because it flows through to the same place. But again, make sure, and I would always advise for partnerships, anything where there's more than one human being, if you don't have an accountant, get an accountant. Uh, and uh, there's many people out there who can do it. And to give you a sense of these things, um, uh, 
If we look at the number of tax filings by entity, and actually the reason I'm enclosing this, and I know it's a little bit outdated, but that interestingly is the most recent data that we have that is thorough and com complete. This is from Berkman Solutions. This is the five-year growth rate between 2010 and 2015 for these businesses, business types. Uh, partnerships, general partnerships that don't have limited liability, we're seeing fewer and fewer of them every year. They're actually declining. Uh, big corporations, C corporations are declining. General partnerships are declining. Limited partnerships, S corporations, LLC, they're growing. People like the, the, that these entities, limited liability, particularly limited partnerships and S corporations, offer liability um, protection. And general partnerships without that liability protection, because it's easy if you, I mean, it's one thing to trust yourself, but you've got to trust your partner in the business as well. And, and, and that's hard to do. And I'd always be extra careful regarding all of those things. Trust them as a business partner, but things can always go wrong. Now, uh, limited partnerships and limited liability partnerships work a little bit like this. Limited partnerships have a general and one limited partner. General partners are another way of saying you make the business decisions. Limited partners often are silent partners that provide financing. This is an LPS, not a limited liability partnership. Taxes are often passed through, but proportional to the partnership agreement. LLPs, uh, which I would, uh, 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 which are very attractive for a lot of uh, uh, partnerships, especially from your doctor's office to your lawyers to everything else, they have no general partners. Uh, and consequently, that means no personal liability. You are liable up to your personal investment. So when we think about what may, I know no one can read this because this is super, super tricky. Uh, uh, I know I have a good private question we're, we're good about S Corps, which we'll get to next. Um, in domestic LPs, where do they fall into? Where do we see limited partnerships typically? Real estate. That is the majority of partnerships across the country is in real estates that are LPs that have a general and limited partner. You might have an investor, you might have someone else. That's where we typically see it. Limited in finance and insurance, this number is shrinking. More people are moving towards greater liability protection. And then right across the board, a slew of every other industry that's out there. And then um, this is a really good question. Ooh, this is a good question involving liability. So we have a, a personal question asking, uh, if I have an S corporation, should I also have an LLC for liability or does the S corp provide enough liability co coverage? I can skip right down to that now. That's a great question. Uh, so, and we'll go over that. We'll skip over C corporations for a second. So S corporations, what, what does it mean? S, S, what is an S corporation? So S corporations, refer to uh, businesses with fewer than 100 shareholders. So we talked about how in an LLC, you could have one or more. An S corporation basically says you're going to have fewer than 100. So these often tend to be closely held businesses, you and a group of your five favorite business colleagues, or it could be also a family business is typically structured this way. S corporations have passed through taxation. They have limited liability. And, uh, uh, and the cool thing about pass-through taxes, it has all the benefits of a corporation, but it uh, avoids the double taxation, particularly in the way that it's structured. Double taxes, again, you have to pay out your income and then you, you, get, you, get, you get taxed on that, you get taxed on your dividends and other distributions from the company. Now, cons. As corporations are capped on their upside. Um, so you can't be publicly traded, which means that you can't grow so big that you need tons of money. Again, in New Mexico, we have two publicly traded companies, Array Solar Technologies and uh, a small uh, Sigma uh, uh, company uh, up in Santa Fe. Uh, uh, and uh, so most people won't have this concern. This is often more expensive to create and destroy and often has administrative burdens associated with it, particularly as the number of employees that you, you, you have increases. This is a favorable corporation to give you a sense. To, I'm gonna to get to the question too. This is a favorable, this is a favorable organization to have, um, to have a, if you are big enough to have employees, big enough to think about expanding to the level where you might have employees, um, big enough to evaluate and look at and offer uh, sufficient liability protection. And the question about LLCs is a really good one. Um, you don't usually need to set up an LLC to, to, to hover this because really an S-Corp to actually, when we start, when we actually form an S-Corp individually, we first start with an LLC. And then you, when you apply for your employee identification number with the IRS, you apply for an S-Corporation election. 
and I actually have a, there it is, there's a copy here. So this is your election by small business corporation. And, uh, and basically what this does is this says your LLC is now going to operate in the form of an S corporation. And here's a list of New Mexico's individual requirements on the left. And on the right, you have the physical IRS form where you kind of go and you go and you, you elect it. It's called form 2553, if you're interested, uh, especially those of you uh, who are looking at doing this. Now, um, on registering an S-Corp with New Mexico, you can check out this. Uh, uh, if somebody has an issue and they're looking at the liability protection with regards to uh, an LLC versus an S corporation, where you'll see differences aren't necessarily within the bounds of liability protection ipso facto, but you'll see yourself treated in different ways uh, for insurance purposes, for funding purposes, uh, for other things that you might have. Now, this is not a negative thing. S corporations are again favorable, particularly if so. LLCs, I'd say the average LLC is somebody, say, in consulting, somebody doing a firm where, where they might not possess employees other than themselves. S corporations can be the same way, but uh, uh, S corporations allow a little bit of increase in here. Uh, because they have up to 100 shareholders, this affords you another cool benefit. Um, which is um, uh, if you partner with, if you're looking at outside equity partners and other things, you can still continue to register as an S Corp uh, because usually you, don't, you won't be partnering with, with a ton of people. As you get much bigger, uh, things like venture capital, they like to take into account um, exit strategies, things about getting out, things about adding people. Then you have to worry about how your, how your corporation is done. But S Corporations as well, eventually you can reconvert them into C Corporations which are your standard shareholder owned companies. So these are your Microsofts, Oracles, everything else out there, all your big companies, all the way down to small companies, small entities that might be structured as C corporations. To give you a background on C corps, about 25% uh, of C corps are small employers, 81% are large employers. For S corps, most of them are small employers. Very few large employed, uh, large employer S corps. It doesn't mean you can't be one. It doesn't mean you can't have more than five and hundred employees. You absolutely can. Uh, it's just harder to get there without external investment. Usually, external investment means they want to, uh, they might uh, incentivize you to force a C election or a C corporation election. So these are shareholder owned. You sell shares of the company. The, the, the company is, is still privately held. It's not publicly traded. That's a different company, uh, different sort of entity. Taxed on corporate profits as well as shareholder dividends. That's what we call double taxation. The pros are limited liability for every shareholder up to their investment level. And it is attractive for institutional investors. And when we think about C corporations about getting funding, C corporations are the most attractive rate, uh, uh, place for big money to invest in because big money looks for exit strategies and ways to get out and also to trade and sell the company to other people. C-Corps make that fairly easy. Cons, it's expensive and often complicated to create a C-Corp. S-Corps are much easier to create. You go through the LLC and that extra step of setting up an S-Corp. C-Corporations, you're gonna have a lot of other things you have to deal with. And what sort of things do C-Corps have to deal with? Think about administrative responsibilities that are legislated into these things. Corporate regulations, right? When are you having meetings? When are your minutes? Your electing officers, board of directors, the level of formality in the C corporation is much, much higher. It will, without a dedicated person in the C corporation to make sure that all these things are happening, even for a small business, it makes it almost unwieldy to keep track of all of these things. Um, and to give you a sense of this, and this is really, um, where we're going. So no, not usually. Now I've heard of people doing that, or, or, or obviously there's a whole industry in the United States and abroad uh, where people set up LLCs or shell corporations that own other LLCs and shell corporations. And, and I've actually been tasked, one of the first jobs I had way back when was trying to disentangle such a vast uh, and interesting array of things. I felt like I was uh, an investigator for narco trafficking or something. Like I was trying to figure out like this entity is owned by this entity, but this entity is guaranteeing the loan. And then we had to go through and it was drawing a bunch of, it can be really, really complicated. And, and often when people think about shells within shells within shells, that's something you can do. It significantly increases your administrative costs. Uh, and unless, <laughs> 
speaking, but you have, but there are reasons to do this. And I'm not going to say this. There are legal reasons to do this. <laughs> and uh, for instance, the reason that so many places are interested in, 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 in setting up shops and in, in low liability environments or places that offer corporate protection, places like the Cayman Islands, uh, is that they're able to do this by structuring their ownership structure in such a way that's very expensive from a legal point of view. But if you have a large corporation with a large amount of vested interest, that can be profitable for you in the long run. Um, and again, not the target of this, that's a separate presentation uh, how to limit your tax uh, liability by looking at external areas. Uh, but uh, uh, this is really, really, it's, it's, it's not as hard as you think it is. The hardest is C Corp to go and maintain. S corps are a little bit, uh, I would say, just because of the original election can be more challenging than LLCs, but don't be intimidated by it. It is something within everybody's power here to feel comfortable about owning and operating. Now, there's something else as well, which might be attractive to a lot of individuals here. And this is something that, that almost 10 years ago, I mean, nobody had heard of this. Five years ago, people were hearing of it and starting to legislate against it. And this just became, in 2020, House Bill 118 passed in New Mexico, which made this a legal entity in New Mexico. And it's called a public benefit corporation. And a public benefit corporation. Now, this is a very interesting concept. What does it mean legally? These are not nonprofit companies. These are for-profit companies that have a legally binding commitment to social and environmental concerns. Okay on your mission of what your company is about, if it's favorable to the environment, social concerns, other things like that, uh, it, it could be considered a public benefit corporation. Traditionally in finance, we look at corporations as focused on one thing alone, and that's profit. And that's profit for shareholders. Now we know that's a simplistic way of looking at this, but we know that it does drive a lot of industry and finance especially nowadays, especially with this generation of retirees, we have a lot of uh, individuals asking the question, you know, I have other things that aren't just profit that I care about and their stakeholder interests. They have things like this. And they have a very specific series of things that they look at to be qualified as a public benefit corporation. Your contributions must be, and this is a direct quote, artistic, charitable, cultural, economic, educational, environmental, literary, medical, religious, scientific, or technological. That covers a lot of bases. And, I'm, and what's interesting about this is, is my guess is any idea that you have could feasibly fall within this sphere. Now, what benefit does it have? Well, it has a benefit if you register, it's mainly, uh, uh, it, it helps with marketing and it helps with your clientele. Uh, uh, public benefit corporations um, are, and I'll give you a couple examples of one here. Let's see, uh, uh, let's see what this is. And so oh, those are probably too small here, but uh, there's a whole bunch of them. We have things like uh, perhaps one that you would all know would be the clothing company Patagonia. Um, Another one, uh, thinking about this, uh, looking at this, uh, uh, if you look for financing, we'll talk about that next is Kickstarter. That's a public benefit corporation. It has really broad ranges for what that means. Now, related to public benefit corporations, but not the same thing. It's a different standard. And what happens is, is PBCs or public benefit corporations started to become um, legal ways that firms could identify themselves in different states. Um, when they, uh, when we can, uh, uh, but it was, but it's far from being uniform right now across the country. And so a parallel um, but different um, certification process developed. And that's something called a B Corp. Now a B Corp is a certification that happens through a nonprofit called the B Lab. And when we think about looking at public benefit corporations, you might elect to say that your corporation is a PBC and a B Corp. It may just be a PBC, but B Corps are considered a gold standard in certifying a, a socially responsible business. 
Um, you don't have to be a PBC to qualify, and that's specific because it's not yet an entity. PBCs aren't a thing in every state, and they've only just become a thing in New Mexico in 2020. So if you're looking at out-of-state businesses that don't have this PBC and you're looking for, or you might be doing it both ways, there's nothing to keep you from having both certifications, you can actually register as a B Corp. And uh, when we look at public benefit corporations and we look at these things as well, um, the jargon for PBC has evolved from this uh, question of being exclusively for nonprofits, exclusively for these things. The legal definition now is for profitable institutions that, for profit institutions that uh, now deal with this category of of um, social, uh, this wide ranging count of social benefit. It does do well if you're marketing to this area, you have clients that value it either upstream or downstream, the people that you get money from or the people that you sell to consider it a valuable entity and it's worth looking into. And it's worth looking into. But that being said, right now, unless it's specified in certain ways, these usually don't come with um, other more direct benefits. I can't argue that PBC represents superior tax benefits. I can't argue that it represents other things, but it is a statement that you wish to make, a very coherent statement to either the people, about the people owning the company and to your potential clientele. And we're gonna see how this rolls. My guess is, is that eventually, uh, uh, there are certain things that PBCs might be um, relevant with, grants, other things that might be specific to PBCs. Um, uh, uh, especially if you're interested in, in, in getting and looking at financing for your company, it is worth exploring. Now we have another question about business. Now we're gonna kind of switch uh, sections for a second and talk a little bit about business financing. Oh gosh, now this is really interesting. This gives work, it's really testy. And I know exactly what it feels like to be on the other side, representing a bank, having to deny or approve someone of a financing authority that will either make their dreams come true or just, oh, it's devastating when you can't make it work. Let's talk about financing and thinking like these business professionals. First of all, do you need money for your business? Most startup businesses, most startup businesses are financed through yourself. Now, that being said, um, I don't want you to dip into your 401k yet. I don't want you to go into those things. Do the homework as to what your business is, how much money you need, and how to evaluate those things. Set expectations right up front. What is the purpose of your business? And this becomes really, really important. So, then it becomes clear. It's not something you can trick anyone out of either because you always you end up in a conversation with somebody who might be interested in giving you money. They're going to figure out in their head a very quick question. Are you setting this up as a hobby firm, something you're doing on the side just when you feel like you have the time or resources or even energy to do it? Is it a lifestyle firm, which is something like saying, I just want the company to get big enough and then I want to live a comfortable life from that. Right. So, for instance, uh, we get a lot of dental offices, a lot of a lot of a lot of individual physician offices, many people. And this is not And the moral of this story is. And there's a book. And if you've read the John Bogle book enough, this isn't about endless greed. <laughs> there is a time you should have a business that makes you feel comfortable enough. And that is perfectly fine to have a lifestyle firm or a hobby firm. The trouble with those two things is it's hard to get financing from those. Or are you building the next Oracle? You're building Oracle 2.0 and suddenly you know you're gonna need millions of dollars in series A, B and C financing in the next five years to make this work. Then you're talking something completely different. Know your ambition level, know your commitment level and know your expertise. Source one is your personal savings. The good news about this, your money, your choice and how to spend it, but also your risk. Watch out when you commingle business and personal financing Please keep an eye on tax implications. If it is a sole proprietorship or something where you're looking at things or you're exploring tax deductions, and I will promise you this, if it doesn't feel right and you're not certain if it's a tax deduction, don't make it a tax deduction. It is not one. Unless you are absolutely certain, do not stretch the limits of the IRS for during audits. Do not explore unanswered questions without the help of a professional representative. 
Number two is gifts. And I'm not talking about you meet somebody like it with a trench coat who offers you a stack of bills. No, we're saying we're talking about your personal network, not just fruit baskets. We're talking about building on your personal network and what we call informal investors to help fund your sources. In your business, in, in your careers, uh, uh, in whatever they might have been, you've made connections with people that are very real. If you feel comfortable with those connections, you might feel comfortable about approaching them looking to help finance your business. But be careful about a couple of things. Unsecured loans. Somebody gives you money and if it's and they write it down and they say these things, right? Could be convenient. Please don't enter into a loan. Think uh, unless you know precisely what your rights are as the borrower and who that money was sent towards. Um, document everything. If you involve anything regarding gifts that support your business, make sure everything is above water. Friends are wonderful and they often, and many will last forever. Some do not last forever. Some business relationships built on friendships and loans that have not been paid back have failed. My guess is if we don't know someone personally, we are within one or two steps of somebody who has. And you can remember that well. And I also wanna be something very sobering about this thing. When you approach somebody for money, and there's, this is from a study, right? This is a graphic from a study that was done a few years back about, they studied 157 successful companies, not the ones that failed. It took them 30 months to stop losing money from their initial incorporation. And it took them six years six and a quarter years on average to break even from the amount of money they originally invested in. So when you ask somebody for money, know that you're asking them to separate themselves from a, a return on their money for at least six years. That's a long time. That's a long time to wait in the bills. And you don't even know if it's going to be successful. So when you think about things of how angels work, about how venture capitals work or other people work, this is in the back of their mind. Think like one of these people. They're worried about when you tie up investments in other places, that reduces their liquidity. And so they invest in things. When people invest in you, they invest in you because they believe in you for the long run. And that is such a credit to you and your business. But it's also something you have to treasure and understand when you have these conversations. When somebody says no, it is because they're worried about this. Something doesn't add up. So there's a few roles here that I want you to be aware of when you look at financing before we get into the types of financing. Now, when you seek outside investors, make sure they are actually considering new proposals and can actually provide the amount of money that you need. They're interested in your company at this stage of growth. And they don't just provide money. They provide advice, support contacts in the business and financial community. We are with, hmm, I have worked with brilliant people who have partnered with bad, who just not bad people, but indifferent people. If somebody, if somebody gives you money and in return, you give them a share of your business, 10%, 20%, 30%, and they do nothing other than provide money, they are not providing you with what you're worth. And your ideas have value. And consequently, you should look to them for guidance, support, and help. Make sure they're, and this goes without saying, reputable, ethical, and have good track records. Be careful of inexperience and overcommitment to other projects. Don't pick somebody, again, as a finance professor, that's just in finance. Don't pick somebody who does those things. And on the right, it gives you a sense of these things. This is, this is, there's all these different flavors of different placements and things. I won't hit this in too much detail, but just know that as your likelihood of getting financing is higher, if you have the more proven your business model is, uh, the more profitable your outlook in the future is, and the bigger you think it could be. It's harder to get financing for things that are hobby interests, and that's okay. Doesn't mean you have to make the next big thing. It just means that it's going to be harder to get financing. So outside options. So this is really interesting. You guys may not be aware of this, or you might be aware of this. So back in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, we uh, as a country became highly concerned about people taking advantage of investors, privately held companies, not publicly traded companies. So they don't have the, the benefit of having to go out and list uh, uh, their financial condition four times a year. 
Privately held uh, hucksters were taking advantage of people, making promises for huge amounts of business investments, and then running away and disappearing without consequence. And so beginning in the 30s, we actually made it illegal in this country to advertise for privately held institute, privately held businesses. And this is really interesting. So advertise uh, uh, owning a piece of a privately held business. Now under President Obama, they passed the Jobs Act, which finally allowed for a gradual opening of something called equity crowdfunding beginning in 2016. And by 2018, this was opened up first to accredited investors, and then it was opened up to everybody. And firms uh, like this, what they do is they have an idea. And you might not have the money individually, so you raise money. You'll say, I'll give up 50 or 40% of the share of my business. I value my business at this much. And you ask everybody in the marketplace to help fund that business. And there are a couple of firms here, WeFunder, MicroVentures, AngelList, those are all big and credible. And to raise money with any of these sites, you have to give them details about your company's operation and growth potential. Let me see here, and I'll see if I can grab one up here. Let's see. Go and I'll get one up here and I'll try not to, I guess I have to put somebody on the spot, so I'll try to be fair about what it is. Let's see, and I'll just, Oh, this is a good one. I'll click this one. This is what's happening. Here's what a website of this actually looks like. Let me, uh, I'm going to share my uh, browser. We'll do some live finance. So this is an example of a crowdfunded project. This is uh, Lil Libros, uh, the number one uh, family trusted bilingual children's media publisher built by community. They have 6,000 people, 900 people, collectively gave $2.5 million. In unlike situations, and this is very key, unlike circumstances where uh, crowdfunding, for instance, for a product doesn't give you a share of that company. If you buy a, a, a crowdfunding when you first heard of it, it might've been for a product or service that people liked, a type of watch, software. And if you gave them enough money, they would send you the product when they were finished with it. This flavor actually reincorporates the company and you become an investor who owns a percentage relative to everyone else who's in the company, relative to their total valuation. And what they do here, you actually have to build out a very distinct business model. So you have clear highlights for investors to understand. You have an explanation of their team members, Ariana Stein and Patty Rodriguez. And then you might have videos, you might have products and services. You, you give in potential investors everything that you might, might be interested in, in producing. They have questions that they ask, Q&As, and they, they talk about their company, their FAQs, all these things. Many of them have financial data also disclosed. So if they're not making money, they give you understanding to say, oh, we expect to make money in the future. As an investor, it can be risky. It's risky because privately held companies, you can lose 100% of your investment if it fails or goes bankrupt. But if it's sold to someone else, the returns can be very big. And it is an option uh, to look at, particularly if you have a company with some established basis uh, that's more than just an idea. You've actually done some business doing something for a period of time. And you can put together a very, very smart looking marketing thing. And I found two firms in New Mexico that were raising money under WeFunder. Uh, this was just a few days ago. Uh, one was called Primus Warranty Services in Albuquerque. The other was Everyday Contacts, also in Albuquerque. And I'm not vouching, I'm, none of this is suggesting you invest in any of these companies. These are merely provided as examples for stuff that you can do when you run your company. So that's an idea, it is new, but it lends itself to a particular type of firm. It's less interesting if your firm is, of course, uh, 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 and many times if your firm doesn't hit certain levels, it won't get funded. So another thing you think of is, well, what about bank loans, right? And this is the most obvious thing. We always associate banks with our consumer loans. Can we associate them with business loans? Yes, but usually uh, only when your business is at least partially or well-established. So bank loans, uh, uh, and this is coming from somebody who used to evaluate these things, bank loans always 
represent secured debt obligations that need to be repaid. It is a reasonable expectation to have to collateralize property or equipment, property, plan, and equipment to get good financing rates. Uh, one of the financing rates we use is called the prime rate. Prime rate goes up, it's established by the Wall Street Journal. It's about 3.25%. The riskier your company, the higher interest rate you'll pay, the less risky, the lower the interest rate you'll pay. A typical interest rate is something like prime plus two, uh, 2% or prime plus 1%. Always watch about interest rates and covenants. Covenants are um, how a bank reserves the right to renegotiate their loan without legal repercussion. So a covenant looks like this. They say you have to maintain a certain level of profitability, a certain ratio number, uh, a certain amount of cash on hand. And if you fail to do that, if you fail to produce the fact that you've been able to do that, the bank can, has the right to renegotiate their loan. It gives them power to raise your rates. It gives them power to do all number of things. Another thing is angel investors. Many, and what is an angel investor? Angel investors sound so delightful. They sound, it's a heavenly, what a heavenly idea. Self-made entrepreneur millionaires, most have college degrees and most have graduate degrees, typically from business or a technical field. They're increasingly diverse. This used to be a very homogenous group. This used to be like if we literally, I have data from 15 years ago, 95% uh, a male, uh, almost exclusively uh, Caucasian. Now they're diverse or about still not as diverse as you might think, 78% male, 22% female. Uh, dominant uh, 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 demographics, the average age is still about 48. These are getting, these are changing with the times, uh, but often these angel investors are able to provide financing uh, to the tune of 25,000 to 100,000. They provide you with screening and feedback. And when you talk to an angel investor, you're gonna be looking at, uh, they're going to be asking you questions about your profitability because every person who invests money, no one invests for free. They always try to figure out what their return will be, either if you sell the company to someone else or, or they sell their shares to other angel investors. Profitability and chance of success. So identifying those two things becomes really important. When you get bigger, you have things like venture capital capitalists, VCs, we always hear about this, right? Uh, if you've been to Menlo Park in California, and all in Silicon Valley, you see this cluster of venture capitals uh, there, the Andreas and Horowitzes of the world all the way down to uh, 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 literally uh, rife with, with VCs. Um, venture capitals uh, funds off, often operate in different ways, but they look for larger investments. They pull these investments into funds for investors. They look for equity and a clear exit strategy. Uh, for instance, we want 40% of your company, and then we will exit when your firm goes public, when it goes up to, when it gets really, really big. Uh, VCs provide board members mentoring, capital, and validation. Watch out for bad relationships. There are bad VCs. Uh, uh, and often bounded, uh, they're often heavily bounded uh, by their need to give a particular return for their investors within a particular time frame. Now, I promised you I'd mentioned something on taxes. Taxes are important, taxes are good. Do not be confused by them. I want you to know a couple big facts. If you know more than a thousand in tax or more, the IRS requires you to pay on your business prepaid taxes, quarterly tax payments four times a year. Uh, uh, at the end of each quarter. Um, and uh, uh, you can calculate your tax uh, form using a 1040 ES if you have, this gets really hard to do uh, if you already have a salary and your side business is part of it and you're trying to balance a number of things. Simply speaking, it is easier to overpay than underpay taxes. Uh, if you err on the side of this, you can pay more knowing, but then of course the finance side of me is time value of money and all of that as well. But I would err on this, for instance, if you have a household income and you're married at $200,000 and your side business brings in uh, $30,000, so a small amount on top of that, you can rightfully assume that you'll pay that higher marginal tax rate on that extra 30,000 that you're earning of about 24%. And, uh, and, and I would move that money aside, make sure that money gets paid accordingly, or both the IRS or the state of New Mexico will charge you fees. And so what do you need to do? So good business plans first, 
help define your purpose and direction. Here's a link to SBA's guide on a business plan. It has a lot of sections. Always, always do your research and make sure it happens. Don't forget the finance side. And we're going to look at a spreadsheet. Just now that I provided today, uh, the NM New organization have graciously um, extended and they emailed you this morning with a spreadsheet. And it is a big one, but I'll show it to you. So do not be intimidated by it. We'll go over this right now. Let me uh, bring this up here. Do 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 retirement worksheet. Here we go. This is a common. This is this spreadsheet you've seen variations of around the world. It's called a score financial protection model. A lot of small business institutes, uh, this uh, from Alaska to um, the East Coast, have used uh, used versions of this online. I took it, made it a little bit simpler, but it's still kind of uh, it's a little bit. It can be a little intimidating. In as simple as possible. What I've done is, and I'll kind of go over it first and what all these things mean. This spreadsheet helps you calculate how much money that you might need for your business as a startup cost. This calculates things like salaries and wages and all things like operating expenses, sales, cash receipts, and all these things. And I'll explain, I'll go into detail in a second. But the cool part about this is once you fill in, everything in yellow are things that you fill in. And they're all highlighted here for you. Green is optional. If you know the information for green, fill it in. But you don't need to fill in green. You can just get by with doing what's in yellow. And then what it does is if you finish it, it will populate your income statement, your cash flow statement, your balance sheet. You can print these out and give it to your future financing partner. And you'll look like a pro because you will be a pro when you get through this spreadsheet. So let's say you start a business and you call this, what should we call this business? Let's call this, I don't know, um, Roxanne's Rocks. Sells rocks. Could be a business, could be a growth industry. <laughs> Nothing is as timely and historic as rocks. Um, let's say for this, and the cool part is once you put in that business name, it will appear on every single spreadsheet all the way through. And then when you do these things, you might have to buy things. You say, oh, I need to buy a plot of land uh, to house my rocks in uh, somewhere, near, near, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere near Los Cerritos or something. And then you need to build, uh, uh, you need to buy some equipment to, to polish the rocks. You need furniture and fixtures. Maybe you need $5,000 of furniture. Maybe you need $10,000 of vehicles. Maybe you need to buy a used car where you can put Roxanne rock, Roxanne's rocks on it on there. And, um, and then you also need things like inventory. Oh, I, gotta, I can't sell rocks if I don't buy rocks. I'm going to go out and I'll put $3,000 of rocks in there. You might have rent deposits, utility, advertising, startup costs. What it does for you, what it does is it calculates that based on just the numbers I threw in there, I need $71,000 to start Roxanne's Rocks. So where's the money going to come from? Here's the thing. This is where you put in your thing. How much are you bringing to the table? Let's say you have $50,000 you can invest in this business. That means, and that means the other money can come from a number of sources. So if I have $50,000, I need to fill it in from other places. Maybe it's a mortgage. Maybe it's another thing. Maybe it's outside investors. Maybe I can get a friend to go and, um, about and do it. And the thing is, is what this does to allow us to look at this question if I'm insufficient in funding or whether I am sufficient or non-sufficient, it will calculate how much extra money I need. Now in salaries and wages, we have owner's compensation, salaries and wages, monthly costs, you have to pay yourself to exist. You can throw in a couple numbers here. Maybe you'll live spartanly on $2,000 a month. Fixed operating costs are the expenses that won't change in your business from month to month. These are things like your, um, and I'll zoom in for the cheap seats here. These are things like your car and truck expenses. Uh, insurance might be a fixed monthly payment. Uh, maybe you need office supplies, postage and delivery. I imagine if you're mailing rocks to people, that's a huge sum of money. Uh, sales and marketing, taxes, telephone, travel. Maybe that's $2,000. You got to market $2,000 a month traveling around with your rocks with you. Uh, and then, of course, you have your individual products and services. So... 
I started up here, and I'm sorry, there's a little bit of an error in this spreadsheet, and I'll apologize. I started it using a cosmetic firm originally, but let's talk about rocks. So we have a subscription service for rocks. We have an option here to put in four different products. One is here, the second is here, and then if you have four products that are extra, you can put them here. And each of these services, it could be consulting, it could be something else. Basically, uh, uh, this is an example where uh, <laughs> I'm really inventing the business as we go along. This has clearly been done uh, uh, very haphazardly, uh, but you can start off with, let's say you can make uh, uh, about $60 per individual rock. There's a variable cost per rock of $8 a rock and you know all these things. And you expect your growth rates of 50% in year two and 50% in year three. This will tell you how much money you're gonna make. And then what happens is, is if I actually go through here and I, this is for uh, if you're highly advanced and wanna look at things like accounts payable and lines of credit and other things, you can put it here, but it will fill out your income statement for you automatically, all this populated with just the information that we had and it tells it breaks it down for each month. And so because I was expecting such an ambitious growth model for my rock subscription, I'm going to make $738,000 in the course of a year. Uh, I look at my expenses because I have very little, I have a very low margin on these rocks. I dig them out of the desert and I bring them back. Uh, uh, I end up with a, a margin of 639. Uh, I end up with uh, uh, expenses of 116, income of 443, and then I can expand this over and over again and get an income statement for year two, an income statement and balance sheet for year three, all the way to the end of time. The point is, is it will show you in a short amount of time if your idea is going to make you money, and it will help figure it out so that you can figure out how to plan for the future and to get investments. So I want you to take a look at this. This is wholly customizable. It's wholly useful. And, and this is, it's a lot. But if you're serious about a business, you'll know when you decide to fill out this spreadsheet. Because <laughs> it's so big. No, it is, uh, it is the best help uh, uh, that you can get. Particularly when you approach individuals, they'll always ask you, they always want to see that you do your homework. Business owners always want to see that you've been able to um, Make reasonable plans uh, for what you think these outcomes will be. A note on financial projections is do your best to make them um, accurate, but know fully uh, that uh, in, in, when you look at financing and other things, you'll be looking for um, uh, sensitivity analyses, which show you how good or bad things may come. Know that the future is uncertain. Be prepared for questions around what happens if we have a recession, what happens if this happens or we lose our product or service? What happens if there's uh, legal concerns or legal liability insurance concerns? And all of those are factors. I just don't have enough time, but I appreciate it so much. But I'm here for a little q and I'll stay as long as I need to, to make sure everybody gets it. Thank you all for sticking around. Thank you, Riley. That was awesome. It's amazing information. And I, I, I really kind of wish we had two more hours because I'm sure there's a million things people would like to ask you. Oh, <laughs> One gosh. thing I wanted to mention with Inkfile, um, we used Inkfile to set ah. up New Mexico New. Okay. Yay. Okay. Um, but I will tell you that they do not guide you through the process of submitting a 1023 if you're a nonprofit. So if you're thinking of setting up a nonprofit, I would just add, get on that 1023 immediately. Don't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Little word um, of caution there. So any questions from anybody? I just don't want to overlook. I know we're close to right at our end time here. Um, but I did want to give everybody the opportunity. So for three seconds, any questions? <laughs> A uh, quick question. Um, a, few, a few years back, uh, there was a, a book written called Business Model Generation, and it led to a, a whole process and template called the Business Model Canvas for outlining one's customers and, you know, uh, products and so forth. Um, is that approach still a pretty good industry standard, if you will, or has, has something else re replaced it in, in the way of thinking through the elements of a, a business model? Uh, Larry, that's a phenomenal question. And in short, 
all those fundamental basics are still there, the way that we process them. Um, what changes is the nature of the conversation you have and the audience that you're in front of and what their expectations are. So to give you a sense of this, I was talking uh, recently with a local venture capitalist who was looking for financing plans. His critique of uh, new businesses he was looking at in New Mexico was that he felt they still had poorly written business plans. Um, he gave an example. He said, I asked him, why don't you invest more in the state of New Mexico? And he goes, well, here's a business plan from California. Here's a business plan from New Mexico. Look at it. Look how it's developed. Look at that nature and the procedure of what it's done. Simple things, right? So we're talking straight up. Uh, do you have an explanation in your contents? Do you, or do you have clearly defined purpose? Are you making taking the time to make financial projections? And, uh, um, and because so many startups in this way, particularly in our state, are still lacking in that institutional knowledge, that is absolutely, absolutely a great place to start. And by the time, if you can follow those guidelines there, and by the time you get in front of someone else to talk about it, they will off, they'll be offered to give you specifics and work on it. If you don't follow those things, if you don't follow that similar spreadsheet, and there's a whole bunch of the business model template model, these sort of things that work here. If you miss on those factors, uh, uh, produce something that looks like that, you'll get to the table. Produce something that, you know, reinventing the wheel, other things. A lot of people are still looking for tried and true ways for you to express how businesses work. Show me the money, show me what the exit strategy is. You can make visualizations. Everything else changes is, is icing on the cake. And it's, but we still, we still have issues, especially locally identifying um, businesses that have worked through their model enough to get it to prime time in front of people. So work on those fundamentals first. And I think uh, uh, that, is, that is wonderful resources. I can bring up a business plan from, uh, if it's a, a well-written business plan from the 80s, <laughs> it's marketable uh, uh, today as opposed to a poorly written one from 2020. I'll put it that way. That's right. great. For, great question, Larry. I really like it. What else? Anyone else have anything I, I can answer or, or look at? Um, side to side to that, there are always different regulations and rules. The SBA, I mean, the SBA model for building a business plan is the same as it has been for a long time. I mean, it's uh, uh, the nature of where you get financing changes, but these detail work, but you still, it's good to have that written up and it's good to have that something that you can drop in front of the table and someone say, look, read this. I know what I'm talking about and I know my business. All right. Who else do we have? Any questions? Anyone else? <laughs> I'm so grateful you all made it today. So I'm so grateful. I know this is our third session. I know you went through a lot to, to get here and you're taking, there's no such thing as a free lunch. I know that uh, you're taking opportunity cost time from doing all the other things that make your life uh, uh, worthwhile and, uh, and, and, and living to spend uh, your lunch with me today. I'm so grateful and uh, please never hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm going to put my email in the, um, put my UNM email in here. If I can be of any service answering any questions, never hesitate to reach out. And uh, thank you guys again. And it's been an honor. Bye.